So you're interested in the 4th Gen C4 Corvette. That is super rad. But with so many permutations over its 12 year lifespan, it can be hard to figure out what year or options are right for you. So in this video, I'm shining some light on the subject with the concisely edited C4 Buyer's Guide that covers everything that matters. I'll show you the highlights of what changed over the C4's run, reliability concerns of different years and options, the truth about their fuel economy, and how much C4s are really worth today. Welcome to Retro Cars Forever. My name is Brad, here once again to talk about my favorite subject, the C4 Corvette. The C4 model years ran from 1984 all the way to 1996. During that run, almost nothing remained the same beyond the basic frame and some odds and ends. So before I go through what changed, let's start with what all C4s have in common. Every C4 was assembled in Bowling Green, Kentucky. All of them are rear-wheel drive two-seaters, built on a perimeter frame with a body made of molded plastic with a fully independent suspension made of aluminum pieces. Instead of traditional coil springs at each corner, each end of the car is suspended by a single leaf spring mounted sideways. Weird, but it works. And with so little actual metal used in a C4's construction, rust is thankfully not much of an issue. All C4s have this awesome clamshell hood that opens for amazing access to their engine bays. Even though there were many different V8s used throughout the years that I'll cover shortly, they all had the same displacement. 5.7 liters equivalent to 350 cubic inches. And all C4 engines were mounted behind the front wheels. So technically, C4s are front mid-engine for better weight distribution. So that means the C8 wasn't the first mid-engine Corvette after all. What was all that hubbub about? Now I'm gonna highlight the changes and specific problem areas of each model year, focusing on differences that might be big enough to sway you to choose one year over another. And by the way, I'm not covering special editions like the ZR1 or the Grand Sport, or even my 1996 Collector Edition, as I already covered all 13 of those in this special edition video here. So turn back your clocks to 1984. You've never seen A new Chevrolet Corvette like never before. Never before! The C4's debut model year was the only one to feature the Crossfire V8, which was mostly a carryover from the C3. This engine is sometimes dubbed the Ceasefire because it's a funky hybrid between fuel injection and carburation that can be difficult to tune. When working correctly, it produced 205 horsepower, the lowest of any C4. But around corners, it was a rocket that could embarrass exotics of the day thanks to its ultra-stiff suspension, especially if you ordered the rock-hard Z51 sports package. 1984 introduced some features that would stick around a while, such as this hilarious foam-padded block that functioned as a primitive passenger side airbag, which Corvette fans call the bread box. Gee, wonder how it got that name. The fully digital displays of these early cars are amazingly rad, but they're known to dim over time, and by now, many owners have switched over to brighter LCD bulbs. The manual transmission option was known as the Doug Nash 4 Plus 3 because it was a weird four-speed manual with three extra electronic overdrives. This was a complex and somewhat fragile transmission that many found difficult to master, and it was actually a bit slower in instrumented testing compared to the automatic. For all those reasons, most buyers chose the four-speed automatic over the manual. Outside, we got this famous turbine wheel design. Notice how the directional spokes curve forward. Trust me when I say other Corvette owners are gonna point out if you get your wheel directions wrong, so I'm gonna go over that here with all the different wheel designs to avoid confusion and embarrassment. For 1985, the Crossfire was fired, and in its place was the L98, which I always thought looked like the facehugger from Alien. The L98 had a more advanced tuned port fuel injection system, which meant it was not only more fuel efficient, but also more powerful. 230 horsepower was good enough for a top speed of 150, one of the fastest cars you could buy at the time. That rock hard suspension was mercifully softened about 25%. Even Chevy admitted they overdid it the previous year. For 1986, a convertible version became available. These convertibles have tops that are manually operated and fold down into this well behind the seats that also functions as the trunk. Be warned that there's not much space back there in the convertibles, especially with the top folded away. So if you want more room for stuff like I needed with my daily, stick with the relatively roomy hatchback design of the C4 Coupe. 
86 also introduced standard anti-lock brakes, making the Corvette one of the very first cars on the market with this advanced safety feature. By 1987, the L98 engine got aluminum cylinder heads and hydraulic roller lifters for a bump of 10 horsepower now at 240. For 1988, Chevy took lessons learned out on the racetrack and applied them directly to the streetcar. That meant new suspension geometry for better handling and beefier brakes. To help fit these upgrades, two new wheel designs were introduced. Produced. These 16-inch Razor-style wheels were standard equipment, and once again, the spokes pointed forward. Car spotters take note, these were only available in 1988. The optional 17-inch wheel design is dubbed the Salad Shooter, which also points that away. In 1989, a slick new ZF six-speed manual transmission replaced the complex and unloved Doug Nash 4 Plus 3. I've driven both, and I find the more conventional ZF six-speed to be a massive improvement in feel and operation. However, one negative of the ZF six-speed is the one to four skip shift system, which thankfully can be eliminated with a simple kit. Check out my C4 Quirks video for more info on how that skip shift system operates. A new option for the convertible was the 64 pound removable hardtop. You can install a hardtop on an earlier car, but note that it takes some special modifications of the brackets to fit. This year also introduced selective ride control. When this system worked, it was a great way to change how firm or soft you wanted your Corvette to ride. The problem is these systems will fail eventually, and finding a replacement shock with a new actuator can easily cost $750 combined just for one corner. That's seven times more than what a conventional Corvette shock goes for. 1989 introduced another potentially troublesome option that you'll want to avoid in future model years as well, the low tire pressure warning system. Bands attached to the wheels would monitor tire pressures and signal a warning light if they sensed that any of the tires were too low. A nice idea, but in practice, these sensors are very finicky. If you ever get your tires changed, the bands are easily broken or switched around to the wrong wheel. That's probably why every C4 I've ever been in with this feature had at least one of these two annoying warning lights permanently lit. In my humble opinion, it's easiest just to skip this feature and use a good old tire pressure gauge instead. 1990 debuted a brand new interior, which featured a more rounded cockpit-like form, with an instrument cluster that was a mix of central digital display flanked by analog gauges. The steering wheel also got an airbag for the first time. 1991 saw styling changes that updated the angular 80s look to a more rounded 90s design. 1991 also introduced these iconic saw blade style wheels. The blades point towards the rear of the car, and that's important because they actually function to suck hot air out of the brakes. The big change in 1992 was the introduction of a new engine. Gone was the L98 and in went the much stronger 300 horsepower LT1. The downside of the LT1 was the fragile OptiSpark distributor system, which was mounted low right below the water pump and could easily short out when moisture built up inside, but more on this later. To help harness that extra power, traction control became standard, called ASR for acceleration slip regulation, which is thankfully defeatable with the push of this button. To help with refinement, the suspension was softened once again, and insulation was added to the interior to cut down on road noise. 93 marked the 40th anniversary of the Corvette, so all Corvettes ordered with leather seats got this special headrest badge. No badge if you ordered the standard cloth seats. Incidentally, 93 was the last year you could order cloth. They sold fewer and fewer cloth seats with each year of the C4, and after this point, leather became standard. 93 also introduced Passkey, a very handy keyless entry system. I covered exactly how this works in my C4 course video, but I'll just say that Passkey makes daily driving my later C4 a breeze. So many great improvements arrived in 1994, such as a new electronic control module. Electrical issues for C4s made before this year can be troublesome, as early Corvettes were pioneers in controlling many of their systems through computers that were laughably antiquated by today's standards. But by 1994, the computerized brain had finally caught up to a point where it could run the car smoothly and make diagnosing any issues much easier to pinpoint. A passenger side airbag arrived and the steering wheel was changed from the old four spoke look to this new two spoke design. While it's not the prettiest, it's a big upgrade in functionality. 
With the upper spokes removed, there's now space for your hands to fully grip the wheel at the correct 9 and 3 o'clock performance driving positions. The bigger opening made it easier to see the gauges behind as well. The seats were redesigned to have less restrictive bolsters, so if you're, say, broad in the beam, you'll fit a lot better in these later chairs. And if you order the optional sport seats, like what my Corvette has, you can still adjust the bolsters inward for performance driving. The best of both worlds. The convertible swapped out the plastic rear window for a much nicer glass design with built-in defroster. For 94, the air conditioning system was switched over from R12 to ozone-friendly R134 refrigerant. I mention this because these days, if your AC needs a recharge, which is to be expected every few years, the R12 found in earlier systems can now be tricky and expensive to buy, whereas R134 is cheap and easy to find anywhere. And converting an older Corvette to use R134 is a job that can cost thousands. So if you get a 1994 and up, you literally won't have to sweat it. The automatic transmission was given electronic control for better performance. I can personally tell you that this newer automatic is a lot more fun and responsive than the older design. Outside, a new five-spoke wheel debuted called a molds. For 1994, these were only available on the Top Dog ZR1 edition, but they became available later on in a few special edition cars like my 1996 Collector Edition. And they can face any way you want! Imagine that! 1995 saw some long overdue improvements for the Corvette that addressed many critiques people had with their earlier model years. Hey, better late than never. In fact, if you're looking for a reliable daily driver that's easy to live with, like I was, I highly recommend that you focus your search on Corvettes made in these last two model years, and here's why. Remember the LT1's OptiSpark distributor that likes to short out if water gets inside? Well, for 95, they installed an improved vented design. It's still not bulletproof, but it's a vast improvement over the earlier OptiSparks. Yet another common C4 complaint you'll hear about is the squeaks and rattles that can plague the interior. Chevy addressed that in 1995 by hiding a number of felt adhesive strips throughout key places inside. It's a noticeable difference. Earlier C4s were prone to the side bolsters of the seats splitting along the edges. But in 1995, a more durable French seam helped keep it all together. If you're a child of the 80s and 90s like myself, you'll recall the searing pain of these metal GM seat buckles branding your skin after sitting out in a hot day. Thankfully, these were swapped out for a more modern plastic style in 95. The fuel injection system was improved to better utilize ethanol in fuel. So if you want the smoothest running C4 with what comes right out of a modern day gas station, you'll want a 1995 and up Corvette. And for you car spotters, the side fender gills behind the front wheels were changed from the older stack design to a more organic look. 1996, the last model year and the one that I own for a few more reasons specific to this year. Top of that list was the 1996 only LT4 engine. The red LT4 is a hot rodded and higher revving version of the LT1 that made 30 more horsepower. I adore my LT4, revving a pushrod V8 all the way up to a lofty 6300 RPM redline is nothing short of spine tingling. The LT4 was only available if you ordered a stick. All automatics got the good old LT1. If, like most buyers in 1996, you were foolish enough to pass up the LT4 manual combo for the LT1 with the automatic, at least you got an improved automatic with an updated torque converter for better responsiveness and durability. On all 1996 Corvettes, the onboard computer diagnostic system was updated to full OBD2 capability. This is incredibly helpful if you live in a state with tight emissions controls like I have here in California. OBD2 allows you to better pinpoint and diagnose any issues that can spur a check engine light. Any off-the-shelf OBD2 reader like the one I have here can be connected for a quick and easy scan of all sorts of useful data. Pretty cool. Gas mileage probably isn't top priority when considering a Corvette, but with gas prices as high as they are right now, I figured I'd at least touch on it. From talking with other owners and from my own research, the EPA's updated highway mileage readings, which is available on their website, seem to be pretty accurate. That works out to 20 miles per gallon for the earliest cars, all the way up to 24 on the later models like mine. Across the board, manuals get around one mile per gallon better than automatics. Whatever the transmission, that's pretty good highway mileage for an older car with a big V8. 
The Corvette achieves this because it has ultra-tall gearing that keeps the engine speed super low. At 70 miles per hour in top gear, my car's engine is barely running above idle speed. But that reasonable Dr. Jekyll highway mileage turns into Mr. Hyde in the city. When you have actual stop and go traffic like we have here in LA, you will get much lower numbers than what the EPA estimates you'll get in the city. 10 to 13 miles per gallon is about what you'll get depending on your year. And in performance driving like on a canyon road or a racetrack, I found 8 to 10 miles per gallon is all you can hope for. Now, if you want to cheap out by running regular gas instead of premium, think again. You can sorta of get away with standard gas in the first few years, but after that, Chevrolet specifically designed these V8s to run their best on 91 octane premium. You gotta pay to play. So, what is a C4 actually worth? This is a tricky subject because traditional sources like Kelly Blue Book aren't very accurate for cars as old as these, and the market has gotten a lot more pricey over the past few years alone. So, I'm going to give you what I think is the most accurate pricing guide for today, based on a variety of sources like recent auction sales, the Corvette Magazine Buyer's Guide, Haggerty's valuation tool, plus what I see out there on the open market and in Corvette groups. These prices are going to be for cars in good to excellent condition with an average amount of miles, which I peg as between 30 and 90,000. Yes, believe it or not, 90,000 miles is actually pretty high for a C4. They can last longer than that, but most C4s are pretty used up by around 140,000 miles. They require quite a bit of work to keep going strong after that point. And once again, I'm not covering the values of special editions because I already covered those in my C4 special edition video. The first thing to understand is that early cars are generally worth less than later ones for several reasons. As you can see in the sales chart, they sold a lot more Corvettes in the first few years. Those early cars also lacked those meaningful improvements that were introduced later on, not to mention the extra effects that sheer age can have on reliability. So let's start with the values of coupes and then move on to convertibles. The least valuable version of any C4 is a coupe with an automatic transmission. The base values for good to excellent examples with 30 to 90,000 miles look like this. Now let's add some common options. Many C4 coupes were sold with an optional see-through target top. Add another 500 bucks if your coupe has one in good shape. Add a one and a half grand premium if the car has a manual transmission, as only one out of four Corvettes were ordered with one, and it's a desirable option for enthusiasts. And that treasured 96 only LT4 manual combo is worth an extra two and a half grand alone. Any sort of non-adjustable performance suspension package like Z51 or Z52 adds another 500 bucks as well. And finally, tack on another two to four grand if the particular example that you are looking at has service records. The more complete the service records are, the more value they add. Records are important because most C4s aren't driven much, and many owners don't realize that even a perfect car that's just sitting around has consumables that need changed every few years because of age, not just because of mileage. Even without use, the multiple different fluids will break down over time. The rubber in the belts or the tires will crack, and the battery will need replacing once at least every five years. These are all important bits of preventative maintenance that most owners ignore, and you can easily spend two to four grand extra to get a Corvette up to a baseline level, even if nothing is actually broken. So what you want is an organized folder like what I have here with records that verify parts and services. This 10 cent folder can actually add thousands to the value of a Corvette. Now let's look at the values of convertibles, which started in 1986. Convertibles are worth a grand or two more than the coupes. That's because they're more rare. Only around one out of three Corvettes in these years were convertibles. The factory produced removable hardtop adds a grand and a half to the price as they're hard to come by these days. The same premium supply from the coupes for manual transmissions, sports suspension packages, and service records. Do a bit of math and there you go. So those are the values of C-Force today, but what about the future? Are values set to take flight, or is there a bubble about to burst? While special editions like the Grand Sport might have spikes here and there, I see base C4 values going on the same trajectory they have for most years, a slow but steady rise. This might seem surprising when compared to the skyrocketing values of the C4 import competition of its day, but keep in mind that those cars didn't sell nearly as well, 
whereas Chevy sold a healthy total of 350,000 C4 Corvettes over the years. Those original new Corvette owners had a pretty high average age of somewhere in the upper 50s, whereas the original owners in the import crowd tended to be much younger and didn't take as good a care of their cars, so even fewer of those import cars have survived. And today, most of the Corvette's competitors are nowhere near as easy to fix or to find parts for. For all those reasons, there are way more clean C4s still on the road. And even though C4s are gaining more appreciation these days, supply and demand are now about equal with inflation. My fearless prediction for a nice C4 is it'll gain an added one grand in value with every year that passes. Who says investments can't be fun? So there's my ultimate C4 buyer's guide. If there's anything I didn't cover that you're curious about, leave a question or comment down below. I'm always happy to help spread the C4 joy. And check out the other Corvette videos on my channel. You might find what you're looking for on this playlist right here. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss more Retro Cars Forever coming to you soon. Once again, thanks for watching. See you next time.